Section 4 of The Defense of Poesy by Sir Philip Sidney. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Thomas Copeland. Section 4. But since I have run so long a career in this matter, methinks before I give my pen a full stop, it shall be but a little more lost time to inquire why England, the mother of excellent minds, should be grown so hard a stepmother to poets, who certainly in wit ought to pass all others, since all only proceedeth from their wit, being indeed makers of themselves, not takers of others. How can I but exclaim, Musa mihi causas memora, quo numera liso? Note, Virgil, Aeneid, 1, 12. O muse, relate to me the causes. Tell me in what had her will been offended. Return to text. Sweet poesy, that hath anciently had kings, emperors, senators, great captains, such as, besides a thousand others, David, Adrian, Sophocles, Germanicus, not only to favour poets, but to be poets, and of our nearer times can present for her patrons a Robert, King of Sicily, the great King Francis of France, King James of Scotland, such cardinals as Bembus and Bibiena, such famous preachers and teachers as Beza and Melanchthon, so learned philosophers as Fractistorius and Scaliger, so great orators as Pontanus and Meritus, so piercing wits as George Buchanan, so grave counsellors as, besides many, but before all, that Hospital of France, than whom I think that realm never brought forth a more accomplished judgment, more firmly builded upon virtue. I say these, with numbers of others, not only to read others' poesies, but to poetize for others' reading. That poesy, thus embraced in all other places, should only find in our time a hard welcome in England. I think the very earth lamenteth it, and therefore decketh our soil with fewer laurels than it was accustomed. For heretofore poets have in England also flourished, and, which is to be noted, even in those times when the trumpet of Mars did sound loudest. And now that an over-faint quietness should seem to strew the house for poets, they are almost in as good reputation as the mountebanks at Venice. Truly, even that, as of the one side it giveth great praise to poesy, which, like Venus, but to better purpose, hath rather be troubled in the net with Mars than enjoy the homely quiet of Vulcan, so serves it for a piece of a reason why they are less grateful to idle England, which now can scarce endure the pain of a pen. Upon this necessarily followeth that base men with servile wits undertake it, who think it enough if they can be rewarded of the printer. And so as Epaminondas is said, with the honour of his virtue, to have made an office by his exercising it, which before was contemptible, to become highly respected, so these men, no more but setting their names to it, by their own disgracefulness disgrace the most graceful poesy. For now, as if all the muses were got with child to bring forth bastard poets, without any commission, they do post over the banks of Helicon till they make their readers more weary than post-horses, while in the meantime they quies meliore luto thinks it praecordia titan, are better content to suppress the outflowings of their wit than by publishing them to be accounted knights of the same order. Note, quies, etc. Sidney makes one line out of parts of two. In English the passage will run, Whose hearts the titan has moulded out of better clay. The titan is Prometheus. Return to text. But I, that before ever I durst aspire unto the dignity, am admitted into the company of the paper blurrers, do find the very true cause of our wanting estimation is want of desert, taking upon us to be poets in despite of Pallas. Now, wherein we want desert were a thankworthy labour to express, but if I knew, I should have mended myself. But as I never desired the title, so have I neglected the means to come by it. Only overmastered by some thoughts, I yielded an inky tribute unto them. Marry, they that delight in poesy itself, should seek to know what they do and how they do, and especially look themselves in an unflattering glass of reason, if they be inclinable unto it. For poesy must not be drawn by the ears, it must be gently led, or rather it must lead. 
which was partly the cause that made the ancient learned affirm it was a divine gift and no human skill since all other knowledges lie ready for any that hath strength of wit a poet no industry can make if his own genius be not carried into it and therefore it is an old proverb orator fit poeta nascitur note the orator is made the poet is born return to text yet confess i always that as the fertilest ground must be manured so must the highest flying wit have a daedalus to guide him that daedalus they say both in this and in other hath three wings to bear itself up into the air of due commendation that is art imitation and exercise but these neither artificial rules nor imitative patterns we much cumber ourselves withal exercise indeed we do but that very for backwardly for where we should exercise to know we exercise as having known and so is our brain delivered of much matter which never was begotten by knowledge for there being two principal parts matter to be expressed by words and words to express the matter in neither we use art or imitation rightly our matter is quo libit indeed though wrongly performing ovid's verse quicquid conabar dicere verso serat never marshalling it into any assured rank that almost the readers cannot tell where to find themselves note ovid tristia four ten twenty six and whatever i tried to express the same was poetry returned text chaucer undoubtedly did excellently in his troilus and cressida of whom truly i know not whether to marvel more either that he in that misty time could see so clearly or that we in this clear age walk so stumblingly after him yet had he great wants fit to be forgiven in so reverend antiquity i account the mirror of magistrates meetly furnished of beautiful parts and in the earl of surrey's lyrics many things tasting of a noble birth and worthy of a noble mind the shepherd's calendar hath much poetry in his eclogues indeed worthy the reading if i be not deceived that same framing of his style to an old rustic language i dare not allow since neither theocritus in greek virgil in latin nor sanazaro in italian did effect it and besides these i do not remember to have seen but few to speak boldly printed that have poetical sinews in them for proof whereof let but most of the verses be put in prose and then ask the meaning and it will be found that one verse did but beget another without ordering at the first what should be at the last which becomes a confused mass of words with a tinkling sound of rhyme barely accompanied with reason our tragedies and comedies not without cause cried out against observing rules neither of honest civility nor of skilful poetry except in gorboduc again i say of those that i have seen which notwithstanding as it is full of stately speeches and well-sounding phrases climbing to the height of seneca's style and as full of notable morality which it doth most delightfully teach and so obtain the very end of poesy yet in truth it is very defectious in the circumstances which grieveth me because it might not remain as an exact model of all tragedies for it is faulty both in place and time the two necessary companions of all corporal actions for where the stage should always represent but one place and the uttermost time presupposed in it should be both by aristotle's precept and common reason but one day there is both many days and many places inartificially imagined but if it be so in gorboduc how much more in all the rest where you shall have asia on the one side and Africa on the other and so many other under kingdoms that the player when he cometh in must ever begin with telling where he is or else the tale will not be conceived now you shall have three ladies walk to gather flowers and then we must believe the stage is to be a garden by and by we hear news of shipwreck in the same place and then we are to blame if we accept it not for a rock upon the back of that comes out a hideous monster with fire and smoke and then the miserable beholders are bound to take it for a cave while in the meantime two armies fly in represented with four swords and bucklers and then what hard heart will not receive it for a pitched field now of time they are much more liberal 
for ordinary it is that two young princes fall in love after many traverses she is got with child delivered of a fair boy he is lost groweth a man falleth in love and is ready to get another child and all this in two hours space which how absurd it is in sense even sense may imagine and art hath taught and all ancient examples justified and at this day the ordinary players in italy will not err in yet will some bring in an example of eunuchus in terence that containeth matter of two days yet far short of twenty years true it is and so it was to be played in two days and so fitted to the time it set forth and though plautus have in one place done amiss let us hit with him and not miss with him when they will say how then shall we set forth a story which containeth both many places and many times and do they not know that a tragedy is tied to the laws of poesy and not of history not bound to follow the story but having liberty either to feign a quite new matter or to frame the history to the most tragical conveniency again many things may be told which cannot be showed if they know the difference betwixt reporting and representing as for example i may speak though i am here of peru and in speech digress from that to the description of calicut but in action i cannot represent it without pacolet's horse and so was the manner the ancients took by some nuntius to recount things done in former time or other place lastly if they will represent a history they must not as horace saith begin abovo but they must come to the principal point of that one action which they will represent by example this will be best expressed i have a story of young polydorus delivered for safety's sake with great riches by his father primus to polymnestor king of thrace in the trojan war time he after some years hearing the overthrow of primus for to make the treasure his own murdereth the child the body of the child is taken up by hecuba she the same day findeth a slight to be revenged most cruelly of the tyrant where now would one of our tragedy writers begin but with the delivery of the child then should he sail over into thrace and so spend i know not how many years and travel numbers of places but where doth euripides even with the finding of the body leaving the rest to be told by the spirit of Polydorus. this needs no further to be enlarged the dullest wit may conceive it but besides these gross absurdities how all their plays be neither right tragedies nor right comedies mingling kings and clowns not because the matter so carrieth it but thrust in the clown by head and shoulders to play a part in majestical matters with neither decency nor discretion so as neither the admiration and commiseration nor the right sportfulness is by their mongrel tragicomedy obtained i know apuleius did somewhat so but that is a thing recounted with space of time not represented in one moment and i know the ancients have one or two examples of tragicomedies as plautus hath amphitrio but if we mark them well we shall find that they never or very daintily match hornpipes and funerals so falleth it out that having indeed no right comedy in that comical part of our tragedy we have nothing but scurrility unworthy of any chaste ears or some extreme show of doltishness indeed fit to lift up a loud laughter and nothing else where the whole tract of a comedy should be full of delight as the tragedy should be still maintained in a well-raised admiration but our comedians think there is no delight without laughter which is very wrong for though laughter may come with delight yet cometh it not of delight as though delight should be the cause of laughter but well may one thing breed both together nay rather in themselves they have as it were a kind of contrariety for delight we scarcely do but in things that have a conveniency to ourselves or to the general nature laughter almost ever cometh of things most disproportioned to ourselves in nature delight hath a joy in it neither permanent or present laughter hath only a scornful tickling for example we are ravished with delight to see a fair woman and yet we are far from being moved to laughter we laugh at deformed creatures wherein certainly we cannot delight 
We delight in good chances. We laugh at mischances. We delight to hear the happiness of our friends and country, at which he were worthy to be laughed at that would laugh. We shall, contrarily, laugh sometimes to find a matter quite mistaken and go down to the hill against the bias in the mouth of some such men, as for the respect of them one shall be heartily sorry he cannot choose but laugh, and so is rather pained than delighted with laughter. Yet deny I not but that they may go well together, for, as in Alexander's picture, well set out, we delight without laughter, and in twenty mad antics we laugh without delight. So in Hercules, painted, with his great beard and furious countenance, in woman's attire, spinning at Omphale's commandment, it breedeth both delight and laughter, for the representing of so strange a power in love procureth delight, and the scornfulness of the action stirreth laughter. But I speak to this purpose, that all the end of the comical part be not upon such scornful matters as stir laughter only, but mixed with it that delightful teaching which is the end of poesy. And the great fault, even in that point of laughter, and forbidden plainly by Aristotle, is that they stir laughter in sinful things, which are rather execrable than ridiculous, or in miserable, which are rather to be pitied than scorned, for what is it to make folks gape at a wretched beggar or a beggarly clown, or against law of hospitality to jest at strangers because they speak not English so well as we do? What do we learn? Since it is certain, nil habet in Felix paupertas durius in se, quam codudiculos homines facit. Note. From Juvenal, Satires 3, 152-3. Poverty, bitter though it be, has no sharper pang than this that it makes men ridiculous, return to text. But rather a busy, loving courtier, a heartless, threatening thraso, a self-wise seeming schoolmaster, a wry, transformed traveller. These, if we saw walking stage names, which we play naturally, therein were delightful laughter and teaching delightfulness. As in the other, the tragedies of Buchanan do justly bring forth a divine admiration. But I have lavished out too many words of this play matter. I do it because, as they are excelling parts of poesy, so is there none so much used in England, and none can be more pitifully abused, which, like an unmannerly daughter showing a bad education, causeth her mother poesy's honesty to be called in question. Other sorts of poetry almost have we none, but that lyrical kind of songs and sonnets which, Lord, if he gave us so good minds, how well it might be employed, and with how heavenly fruits, both private and public, in singing the praises of the immortal beauty, the immortal goodness of that God who giveth us hands to write and wits to conceive, of which we might well want words, but never matter, of which we could turn our eyes to nothing, but we should have ever new budding occasions. But truly, Many of such writings as come under the banner of unresistible love, if I were a mistress, would never persuade me they were in love. So coldly they apply fiery speeches, as men that had rather read lovers' writings, and so caught up certain swelling phrases, which hang together like a man which once told me the wind was at northwest and by south, because it would be sure to name winds enough, than that in truth they feel those passions, which, easily as I think, may be bereaved by that same forcibleness or energia, as the Greeks call it, of the writer. But let this be a sufficient, though short, note, that we miss the right use of the material point of poesy. Now for the outside of it, which is words, or, as I may turn it, diction, it is even well worse so is that honey-flowing matron eloquence apparelled, or rather disguised, in a courtesan-like painted affectation. One time, with so far-fet words that may seem monsters, but must seem strangers to any poor Englishman, another time with coursing of a letter as if they were bound to follow the method of a dictionary, another time with figures and flowers extremely winter-starved. But I would this fault were only peculiar to versifiers, and had not as large possession among prose printers, and which is to be marvelled among many scholars, and which is to be pitied among some preachers. Truly I could wish, 
if at least I might be so bold to wish in a thing beyond the reach of my capacity, the diligent imitators of Tully and Demosthenes, most worthy to be imitated, did not so much keep Mazzolian paper-books of their figures and phrases as by attentive translation, as it were to devour them whole and make them wholly theirs. For now they cast sugar and spice upon every dish that is served to the table, like those Indians, not content to wear earrings at the fit and natural place of the ears, but they will thrust jewels through their nose and lips, because they will be sure to be fine. Tully, when he was to drive out Catalan, as it were, with a thunderbolt of eloquence, often used that figure of repetition as vivit. Vivit? Immo vero etiam in senatum venit. Note. He lives. Lives? Aye, he comes even into the senate, returned text. Indeed, inflamed with a well-grounded rage, he would have his words as it were double out of his mouth, and so do that artificially which we see men in collar do naturally. And we, having noted the grace of those words, hail them in sometime to a familiar epistle, when it were too much collar to be choleric. Note. I suspect that Sidney here intends a pun upon collar and colour, colour in the sense of figure of speech, rhetorical ornament, artifice. If this surmise is correct, we must understand when it were too highly rhetorical to simulate anger. In the following sentence, similitaire cadences, a partial anglicization of Quintilian's cadencia similitaire, a translation of the Greek rhetorical term, which is allied to and frequently identical with rhyme. Return to text. How well store of similitaire cadences doth sound with the gravity of the pulpit, I would but invoke Demosthenes' soul to tell who with a rare daintiness useth them. Truly they have made me think of the sophister that with too much subtlety would prove two eggs three, and, though he might be counted a sophister, had none for his labour. So these men bringing in such a kind of eloquence, well may they obtain an opinion of a seeming fineness, but persuade few, which should be the end of their fineness. Now, for similitudes in certain printed discourses, I think all herborists, all stories of beasts, fowls, and fishes, are rifled up, that they may come in multitudes to wait upon any of our conceits, which certainly is as absurd a surfeit to the ears as is possible. For the force of a similitude, not being to prove anything to a contrary disputer, but only to explain to a willing hearer, when that is done, the rest is a most tedious prattling rather overswaying the memory from the purpose whereto they were applied than any wit informing the judgment already either satisfied or by similitudes not to be satisfied for my part i do not doubt that when antonius and crassus the great forefathers of cicero in eloquence the one as cicero testifieth of them pretended not to know art the other not to set by it because with a plain sensibleness they might win credit of popular ears, which credit is the nearest step to persuasion, which persuasion is the chief mark of oratory. I do not doubt, I say, but that they use these knacks very sparingly, which who doth generally use, any man may see doth dance to his own music, and so be noted by the audience, more careful to speak curiously than truly. Undoubtedly, at least to my opinion undoubtedly, I have found in divers small learned courtiers a more sound style than in some professors of learning, of which I can guess no other cause but that the courtier following that which by practice he findeth fittest to nature, therein, though he know it not, doth according to art, though not by art, where the other, using art to show art and not to hide art, as in these cases he should do, flieth from nature, and indeed abuseth art. But what? Methinks I deserve to be pounded for straying from poetry to oratory. But both have such an affinity in the wordish consideration that I think this digression will make my meaning receive the fuller understanding, which is not to take upon me to teach poets how they should do, but only, finding myself sick among the rest, to show some one or two spots of the common infection grown among the most part of writers, 
that acknowledging ourselves somewhat awry we may bend to the right use both of matter and manner whereto our language giveth us great occasion being indeed capable of any excellent exercising of it i know some will say it is a mingled language and why not so much the better taking the best of both the other another will say it wanteth grammar nay truly it hath that praise that it wanteth not grammar for grammar it might have but it needs it not being so easy in itself and so void of those cumbersome differences of cases genders moods and tenses which i think was a piece of the tower of babylon's curse that a man should be put to school to learn his mother tongue but for the uttering sweetly and properly the conceits of the mind which is the end of speech that hath it equally with any other tongue in the world and is particularly happy in compositions of two or three words together near the greek far beyond the latin which is one of the greatest beauties that can be in a language now of versifying there are two sorts the one ancient the other modern the ancient marked the quantity of each syllable and according to that framed his verse the modern observing only number with some regard of the accent the chief life of it standeth in that like sounding of the words which we call rhyme whether of these be the more excellent would bear many speeches the ancient no doubt more fit for music both words and tune observing quantity and more fit lively to express diverse passions by the low and lofty sound of the well-weighed syllable the latter likewise with his rhyme striketh a certain music to the ear and in fine since it doth delight though by another way it obtaineth the same purpose there being in either sweetness and wanting in neither majesty truly the english before any other vulgar language i know is fit for both sorts for for the ancient the italian is so full of vowels that it must ever be cumbered with illusions the dutch so of the other side with consonants that they cannot yield the sweet sliding fit for a verse the french in his whole language hath not one word that hath his accent in the last syllable save in two called antepenultima and little more hath the spanish and therefore very gracelessly may they use dactyls the english is subject to none of these defects now for rhyme though we do not observe quantity yet we observe the accent very precisely which other languages either cannot do or will not do so absolutely that sejura or breathing place in the midst of the verse neither italian nor spanish have the french and we never almost fail of lastly even the very rhyme itself the italian cannot put in the last syllable by the french called the masculine rhyme but still in the next to the last which the french call the female or the next before that which the italians call stucciola the example of the former is buono suono of the stucciola is femina semina the french on the other side hath both the male as bon son and the female prese tese but the stucciola he hath not where the english hath all three due true father rather motion potion with much more which might be said but that already i find the triflingness of this discourse is too much enlarged so that since the ever praiseworthy poesy is full of virtue breeding delightfulness and void of no gift that ought to be in the noble name of learning since the blames laid against it are either false or feeble since the cause why it is not esteemed in england is the fault of poet apes not poets since lastly our tongue is most fit to honour poesy and to be honoured by poesy i conjure you all that have had the evil luck to read this ink-wasting toy of mine even in the name of the nine muses no more to scorn the sacred mysteries of poesy no more to laugh at the name of poets as though they were next inheritors to fools no more to jest at the reverend title of a rhymer but to believe with aristotle that they were the ancient treasurers of the grecian's divinity to believe with bembus that they were first bringers in of all civility to believe with scaliger that no philosopher's precepts can sooner make you an honest man than the reading of virgil to believe with clausurus the translator of cornutus that it pleased the heavenly deity by hesiod and homer under the veil of fables to give us all knowledge logic rhetoric philosophy natural and moral and quid known 
to believe with me that there are many mysteries contained in poetry which of purpose were written darkly lest by profane wits it should be abused to believe with undino that they are so beloved of the gods that whatsoever they write proceeds of a divine fury lastly to believe themselves when they tell you they will make you immortal by their verses thus doing your name shall flourish in the printer's shops thus doing you shall be of kin to many a poetical preface thus doing you shall be most fair most rich most wise most all you shall dwell upon superlatives thus doing though you be libertino patronatus you shall suddenly grow herculea proles si quid mea carmen apposunt note though you be from horace the son of a freedman you shall suddenly grow herculea proles ovid if aught my verse can do virgil aeneid return to text thus doing your soul shall be placed with dante's beatrice or virgil's and Chises. but here fie of such a but you be born so near the dull-making cataract of nihilus that you cannot hear the planet-like music of poetry if you have so earth-creeping a mind that it cannot lift itself up to look to the sky of poetry or rather by a certain rustical disdain will become such a moam as to be a momus of poetry then so i will not wish unto you the ass's ears of midas nor to be driven by a poet's verses as bubinax was to hang himself nor to be rhymed to death as is said to be done in ireland yet thus much curse i must send you in the behalf of all poets that while you live you live in love and never get favour for lacking skill of a sonnet and when you die your memory die from the earth for want of an epitaph end of the defence of poesy read by thomas copeland